Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us and welcome to Anderson House. My name is Andrew Allen and I'm the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers and their French counterparts who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory and legacy of the American Revolution. In addition to tonight's author's talk, the Institute fulfills that aim by supporting advanced study, developing exhibitions and other historical programs and tours, advocating historic preservation, and providing resources to classrooms nationwide that benefit teachers, students, and scholars alike. Tonight's author's talk, a program that is made possible in part from a generous gift from the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati, features historian Jack Kelly discussing his new book, God Save Benedict Arnold, The True Story of America's Most Hated Man, which was just published two days ago by St. Martin's Press. Uh, Jack Kelly is a public scholar and historian. He is the author of several books on the American Revolution, including Valcor, the 1776 campaign uh, that saved the cause of liberty, which was published in 2021. A Band of Giants, The American Soldiers Who Won American Independence, published in 2016, and Gunpowder, Alchemy, Bombards, and Pyrotechnics, which was published in 2009. A New York Foundation for the Arts Fellow, Mr. Kelly has appeared on NPR, PBS, and the History Channel, and has also written for several national publications, including the Wall Street Journal and American Heritage. But before I turn things over to Mr. Kelly, I must, as always, cover the usual housekeeping items for our friends tuning in with us on Zoom this evening. Uh, following tonight's author's talk, there will be a question and answer session, so please feel free to submit your questions at any point during the presentation by using the Q&A function, which can be found at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted by using the chat function, and one of our staff members will be monitoring that so they will do their best to assist you. Uh, so with all of that, and without further delay, please join me in welcoming to Anderson House, Mr. Jack Kelly. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, it's a great honor to be invited here, and I appreciate everyone coming this evening. Um, I'm going to talk for about 35, 40 minutes and then take some questions, and um, I also appreciate people uh, tuning in on Zoom. Benedict Arnold today has more name recognition than any other soldier that fought in the Revolutionary War. And everybody that knows Benedict Arnold knows one thing about him. I'm not going to say what that is because you know what it is. But I wrote the book partly to get across the idea that there's more to Benedict Arnold than that one thing. And that it's important to understand Arnold uh, in order to get a clear picture of the Revolutionary War. And I'm going to go into some of the reasons as I go through the talk. I also feel that uh, Benedict Arnold is a, um, a good portal into the early years of the war. He was involved in almost every uh, um, uh, major campaign uh, during the first three years of the war. Um, so I'm gonna go through a few of Benedict Arnold's achievements. My book is not a biography of Arnold. Uh, it's more of a manifesto or uh, making the case for Arnold. The Revolutionary War began on the morning of uh, April 19th, 1775, when British Redcoats shot and killed eight Minutemen at um, Lexington Green, and the Patriots came back and killed more than 70 of the King's soldiers, and the war was on. Three weeks later, on May 10th, Benedict Arnold captured the most strategic fortification in 13 colonies at Fort Ticonderoga on Lake Champlain in Northern New York. And he not only captured the fort, but he, he then on his own initiative without any orders, went up into Canada and 
captured a sloop of war that was the only British warship on Lake Champlain, thereby securing the lake for the Patriots and protecting Fort Ticonderoga from being quickly retaken. The question is, um, was this an important achievement? I think it was because the British um, strategy for the first two years of the war was to capture this um, water corridor that runs from Montreal down Lake Champlain, down Lake George, connects to the Hudson River, and runs all the way down to New York. This was sort of the super highway of the colonial period. Uh, there were very few roads that were uh, passable, particularly for an army. And uh, the British thought that by capturing that corridor and gaining control of it, they would um, be able to divide the colonies, isolate New England, and win the war. But the, the obstacle was Fort Ticonderoga and the Patriot control of the lake. Um, in addition, the guns that were confiscated from Fort Ticonderoga during the following winter was were carried across the state of Massachusetts on sleds uh, and used by George Washington for his first victory of the whole war, which was to capture, uh, was to force the British out of Boston. So it seems like the capture of Ticonderoga was a very uh, a big deal in the early years of the war. And what does it say in the history books? It's basically a footnote. Uh, it's not given much importance. And the credit when it's given is often given to Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys. And it's true that Green Mountain Boys did supply the manpower for the takeover of Ticonderoga. Uh, the Green Mountain Boys, of course, were a uh, vigilante group that uh, Ethan Allen had gotten up uh, before the war and really had nothing to do with a dispute with England. Um, but after the excitement was over at Ty Ticonderoga, the Green Mountain Boys basically just went home. Ethan Allen, uh, if you look at his participation in that operation or in the, the war as a whole, um, I don't know, I, I don't think I would have named a furniture company after him, but they do love him up in Vermont. Um, the leadership, the, the, the idea for taking over Ticonderoga was Benedict Arnold. The leadership was Benedict Arnold. And most importantly, I think the, the initiative to take control of the lake was all Benedict Arnold. So that, brings us to the question of, uh, do we owe it to Benedict Arnold to get the history right? And I don't think we do. Uh, Benedict Arnold was a traitor. There's nothing in my book that uh, exonerates him or diminishes the severity of his treason. And in fact, I think he, his treason was worse than most people imagine it to be. So we don't owe him anything, but we owe it to ourselves to uh, iron out the discrepancies in history that result from the fact that Arnold was a paradox. He was a hero and he was a villain. He, he pushed for the revolution. He betrayed the revolution. The way to um, get rid of that hard to, you know, it's hard to get your mind around that paradox. So over the years, people tried to get rid of it by saying he was never a hero at all. It was a very simply a traitor from the beginning and his, uh, accomplishments were insignificant, his uh, participation was minimal, his motives were suspect. Some of the early biographies said he was a nasty little boy, and so he must have been a, a, a traitor from the cradle. And all these are distortions of history and are kind of uh, uh, history for children. The, 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 the Parson Weems history where everybody's just good or bad and, and George Washington couldn't tell a lie. And I think a, a key reason to pay attention to Benedict Arnold is that our history is full of paradoxical characters 
And if we take a, an adult approach to history, uh, we have to look at all the nuances, the conflicts, the contradictions. Um, it, just in the Revolutionary War era, Aaron Burr, uh, Ethan Allen himself, General Charles Lee. These were, they were certainly were not as treasonous as Benedict Arnold proved to be, but they were conflicted, they wavered, they had the good and, ba good and bad aspects to them. And then going on in history, you know, you get, you get to people like John Brown. He tried to, to free slaves, but he, he resorted to violence. Was he a good person or a bad person? He was a complex and paradoxical person. So I think looking at Benedict Arnold is instructive. You know, he's, he's an he's a, um, instructive example of this type of paradox. And it's important because uh, paradoxical people can be dangerous, and certainly Benedict Arnold was dangerous. So we jump ahead now to 1776. This is one of the gunboats that the Patriots had on uh, Lake Champlain. This is a replica that was made up at the, at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, um, exact replica of one of the gunboats. And we now see the importance of um, the takeover of Ticonderoga because the British now are going to launch their invasion from Canada. They sent a 7,000 man army over to Canada, they have a lot of artillery, but they can't come down Lake Champlain because if they start to bring the army down in transports, uh, they would be vulnerable to, to uh, Patriot warships. So the British have to, have to um, build their own warships. And there begins a, a, a arms race Benedict Arnold is down here, uh, what's labeled as Skeensboro, uh, at the very southern tip of Lake Champlain, building gunboats and um, small sailing ships. And the British are up in St. John's up here, doing the same thing. Only the British have a lot more resources, uh, a lot more expertise at building ships, and um, they're building a much larger fleet. That goes on all summer. Finally, Arnold goes up to the north end of uh, Lake Champlain with a very small fleet to wait for the British to come down. Mostly gunboats, few few sailing boats, what they called um, uh, row galleys that could be both rowed and sailed. He waits there all through September and the British are still building. They wanted to have overwhelming firepower before they came down the lake. So Arnold then um, pulls back to here to Valcour Island where he could protect the, the, his fleet from the storms that come down the lake in the, in the autumn. It was hidden and it was protected. It's about a mile, Valcour Island is about a mile off the um, New York shore. And it wasn't until October 11th that finally the British uh, felt that they had the firepower they wanted, and they came down the lake with a, a, a much bigger fleet uh, than the Americans expected, uh, including a, a full-size frigate, which was really a, 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 um, an ocean-going ship that they uh, dismantled and, and then rebuilt on Lake Champlain. Uh, Arnold, second in command, said, we got to get out of here. This is suicidal to wait here in this little uh, uh, bay for the British to come down and attack us. And Arnold said, "No, we're gonna we're gonna fight the British." He had a strategy. His, he always seemed to have a plan. This, his uh, his capability with uh, tactics and strategy was really quite remarkable, and he had thought it out. He, he uh, formed the line of the, um, in the north end here, of the uh, warships that the Patriots had and the gunboats at anchor. And the, uh, the there was no entry into the bay from the north because that was a, a shallow water and shoals there. So the British had to come around from the south and then sail up into the wind 
to attack the Americans, and the, the battle took place basically in here, uh, seven hours, point blank cannon range, very brutal fighting. Uh, it got dark, and the British um, had not been able to break through the American line. They were still standing. But the Americans ex expended th three quarters of their ammunition. Uh, they um, Many of their boats were damaged. Uh, so now what? Uh, Benedict Arnold, again, he said, I have a plan. We're going to escape. And the escape from Valcour um, Bay straight through the British blockade uh, was almost like a fairy tale. In the middle of the night, very quietly, they were able to slip through because of Arnold's foresight and move down the, farther down the lake. There was more fighting farther uh, uh, south on Lake Champlain. The uh, Patriot fleet was largely destroyed, but the outcome was that by the time the British did get their army down to Ticonderoga, it was already getting on to November, <clears throat> and they thought it was too late in the season to uh, start a siege of uh, Fort Ticonderoga. So they decided to go back to Canada and try again in the spring. So the campaign in the North in 1776 was a complete success. Was that an important achievement? Well, we look at the other end of that water corridor in New York City, George Washington in August lost the biggest battle of the entire war, the Battle of Brooklyn. He got pushed out of New York City. He got pushed off of Manhattan, fought up in White Plains, but then was pushed across New Jersey until he ended up at the very bottom there in um, Pennsylvania on the other side of the Delaware River. This 20,000 man army shrunk down to 3,000 men. And um, he wrote a letter to his brother and he said, I think the game is pretty near up. And if he had to also contend with a, an invasion coming down the Hudson River, I think it would have been curtains. But instead, um, Benedict Arnold and Horatio Gates together brought more than 600 men from Fort Ticonderoga on boats down to Kingston, New York, and they then marched out to join Washington's army. Um, some of the men who fought at, um, at Valcour Island also crossed the Delaware River on Christmas night with Washington and fought in his most spectacular battle at uh, Trenton. Arnold was not one of them because um, he had been sent off on another assignment, but it was his uh, success in the North that made that possible. So what do the history books say about this operation of Arnold's, this achievement? Um, I can't say it was, that it's just a footnote because uh, there was a book a, a couple of years ago called Valcour, the 1776 Campaign to Save the Cause of Liberty that I wrote myself. But I, um, when I was researching that book, I was surprised at how little had, had been written about uh, the Northern Campaign uh, in 76. And uh, I, put, I picked up David McCullough's book, uh, 1776, which is about the war in that one year. And I have tremendous respect for David McCullough. I think he's a great writer and a great historian. But he didn't slight the campaign in the North. He just didn't mention it. There's not a single mention of the entire fighting in the North or Benedict Arnold in, the, in his book that's focused on the war in that year. And I think he didn't want to. He didn't want to um, have his story tainted by the treason of Arnold. He wanted to tell the story of George Washington. Uh, but it, it's a little bit of a distortion of history if you just figure that's all that happened in that year. So we jump ahead now to um, 1777. This was Arnold's house in uh, New Haven, Connecticut. 
uh, was supposed to be the biggest house in, in the town at that time. And he was there, um, he went there on, on leave after the fighting season was over. He'd been at war for t almost two years. He was, uh, um, uh, had this great success up on, on Lake Champlain and he decided to resign his commission in the Continental Army. Uh, the main problem was that he had expected promotions and not been given the promotion. Uh, George Washington thought he deserved the promotions, but all the promotions then of, of the higher uh, levels of officers were controlled by Congress. And they were in a, in a kind of a dither about how to, how to um, put a system in place that made sense of how to promote officers. They thought that there should be, um, seniority should be a factor, of course, that was very important in all armies of the time. Uh, merit, they tried to figure out, you know, how, what had this person done? What had he shown himself? And, but then they came up with another idea that uh, it should be by the numbers of troops that the states had contributed to the cause, to the Continental Army. So that put a lot of political, uh, uh, made a, a political um, uh, sort of uh, factor that factored into the promotions. Uh, John Adams, who was uh, in, in many ways the uh, Secretary of War, though he didn't have that uh, title, at the time, he said that he thought that uh, officers should be uh, uh, promoted according to their morals, their honor, and their dis uh, their uh, discretion. And then he said, and they should also uh, Congress should also consider their genius, their spirit, their reflection, their science, their literature, and their breeding. And then he said, well, and of course, we don't want to appoint anybody we don't know, which, me which meant connections were also very important. So it was a real, it was, it was a, a mess, and they, they came up with a, a system that was no system. And uh, George Washington wrote to Arnold, and he said, I confess this is a strange mode of reasoning, uh, but it may serve to show you that the promotion, which was due to your seniority, was not overlooked for want of merit in you. It was just, it was so confused that they had, and what they had done was promote uh, junior officers over his head. And that was a slap in the face to any officer. Uh, but Connecticut had already had two major generals and they just thought they weren't gonna make another one from Connecticut. Um, you know, it was politics. I, I, it was sort of interesting that in the last uh, few weeks or months, I guess, uh, Congress has been uh, involved in some military promotions and not doing a great job of, but, of it uh, as it turned out. So um, Arnold went to Philadelphia and turned in his resignation and he was done. And the same day that he turned in the resignation, uh, news arrived at Philadelphia that Ticonderoga had fallen. And uh, General Burgoyne was bringing the 7,000 men now without any resistance on Lake Champlain down to um, Ticonderoga, took Ticonderoga easily and was on the march towards Washington, uh, towards um, Albany. Benedict Arnold forgot all about his resignation, jumped on a horse, rode up, joined General Gates. Uh, together they decided to um, meet we're going at the Bemis Heights, which is right down here, a, a couple of miles south of uh, Saratoga. The village of Saratoga, which is today is called Schuylerville. Uh, they fought two battles collectively, the Battle of Saratoga. In both battles, um, Burgoyne tried to sweep around the left end of the American line. In both battles, Benedict Arnold was in command of the left division. In the first battle, he, he stopped were going cold and um, inflicted pretty heavy casualties. In the second battle, he decisively defeated him and then let, personally led a charge into the British field fortifications and uh, broke through. 
and put Burgoyne in a position that he uh, where he had to do what he said he would never do, which was to retreat. Benedict Arnold was severely wounded in that battle and um, uh, had a, a bullet shatter his leg bone. But uh, Burgoyne, 10, year, 10 days later, uh, had to surrender his entire army to General Gates. So was that an important achievement? Uh, it's called the turning point of the Revolutionary War. It certainly did change the complexion of the war and brought the French in. Uh, Time magazine said that it was the single most important battle fought anywhere in the world in the last thousand years. So sounds pretty important. So what do the history books say? Well, they can't say it wasn't important, but there were many stories circulated and did get into the histories of, of uh, the Battle of Saratoga over the years that Benedict Arnold was drunk, that he was, um, they never left the American camp, that he um, was sulking in his cabin, that he had been relieved of his command. Well, he must have been on the field because he was wounded. So they said he was out on the field riding around like a crazy man. But today, most of those stories are, are being either debunked. There's actually been some new evidence uh, about Saratoga has come to light. And um, many historians now uh, accept the fact that Benedict Arnold was the essential man in the essential battle of the Revolutionary War. Three years later, in 1780, we come to the one thing that everybody knows about Arnold. He went over to the British. And this is a, a effigy of him that was dragged through uh, uh, Philadelphia, where he's both two-faced and has a mask and has the devil uh, uh, turning him one way and the other as he goes off to the gallows. Uh, people really were shocked by his uh, treason. Um, of course, the question is, why did he do it? Um, and again, there's many reasons, and uh, a lot of historians have their, their favorite uh, theory as what caused Arnold to go over to the British. Some say it was the money. It was strictly the money that they paid him uh, to, to uh, come over to their side and uh, act on their behalf. Some said his wife made him do it. He'd married Peggy Shippen, a 19-year-old uh, loyalist leading young lady from Philadelphia. Some said that he didn't like the French alliance. He, he had grown up hating the French. Some said that he didn't like the idea of independence. Um, some said it was strictly the uh, promotions and that he was disgruntled with Congress. My own answer to that question is, I don't know. And I think uh, I discussed many of the factors in the book and I, I, I raised some possibilities that are I admit are pure speculation, but I think that Benedict Arnold is an enigma. And sometimes I wonder if he even knew himself why he changed sides, but he did. And because he never did anything by halves, he gained control of the um, this area, which is this, the, the uh, lower Hudson Valley which includes West Point, and he agreed with the British uh, to hand over West Point, which of course was not a military academy then, was a, a major fort protecting the Hudson River. Um, Shakespeare wrote a lot of plays about history, but I think sometimes history seems to create its own dramas, and the unfolding of Arnold's plot is one of them uh, Arnold met in uh, Haverstraw, which is right here. That was neutral. That was neutral ground, um, and he met with Major John Andre, who was the head of British intelligence. They discussed the plan to uh, Arnold was going to allow the British to take over West Point. Arnold had drawn a map of the fort. He, he had given uh, uh, 
Major Andre information about the troop deployments. They talked all night. Uh, Arnold went back to his headquarters in a, a house that had been confiscated opposite West Point on the east side of the river. And Major Andre, um, after some delays, came across at uh, the ferry near Peekskill and was riding on horseback down the east side of the um, of the Hudson River in civilian clothes. Uh, and he got down as far as around Terrytown, right around in here. And he was very excited and he was very nervous. He was excited because he had pulled off the biggest intelligence coup of the war. And he was nervous because this area that he was had to go through was no man's land. Westchester County in New York uh, was below the American lines and above the British lines. And it was patrolled by both uh, militiamen from both sides. So he was trotting along on his horse, uh, thinking he's really made his career with this move. And uh, th three men jump out of the bushes, stop him, point muskets at him. And um, Major Andre makes a mistake of saying, I hope you're of our party. And one of the militiamen, who's probably not as dumb as he looked, said, oh yeah, what party is that? So now Major Andre had to guess. And he said the lower party, uh, meaning the British down in New York. And the, um, the militiamen said, uh, we're Americans, get down. And they uh, searched Andre, they found the documents, he offered them bribes to let him go and, uh, and promised them money that they were supposedly going to get later. Uh, they rejected all that. They took him to their commanding officer, Colonel Jameson. Um, I, in my opinion, Colonel Jameson was a little slow on the uptake because the first thing he did was to write a letter to his commanding officer, Benedict Arnold. And he said, there's something suspicious going on down here. After the courier took the letter off to Arnold, or had it up, up the river to deliver it, uh, Jameson started thinking, and he, um, he said, wait a minute, now this, is, this looks like Arnold's handwriting on these documents. So he decided then to uh, send everything to George Washington. So he sent the documents and another letter to George Washington, and this is where the... Um, plot twist comes in that uh, Shakespeare might have thought of. Uh, uh, Washington was not in the American camp, which was over on the New Jersey border at that time. Uh, he had gone out to Hartford, Connecticut to meet with French officers and was on his way back to um, join up with the army again. And he was, uh, this is now Sunday, and he was on Monday morning, was scheduled to have breakfast with Benedict Arnold and his wife at Arnold's headquarters, and then they were going to go across the river and, and inspect West Point. So you have a tense situation where this is a, a little bit more, a closer map of um, the fort at, um, at West Point. And Arnold's uh, Arnold was staying in the house down here. It's marked the Bever uh, Beverly Robinson house. They confiscated from a loyalist. And um, there was two couriers heading for, for that house because the one courier had found out that's where he could find Washington. The other courier was coming directly to Arnold and Washington is coming down from the north um, headed for the same place. So um, some of Arnold, uh, some of George Washington's aides uh, arrive at Arnold's house. He said, General Washington is just up the road. Uh, get ready. He's going to be here in a few minutes. At that moment, the courier arrives and hands a letter to Benedict Arnold. Arnold reads it. He tells his wife, I got to go. He tells everybody else, uh, I'm going over to West Point. Tell Washington to wait here. Um, 
he goes down to the the um no, if I can there's a boat launch down there. He rides his horse down to the boat launch. He gets in his boat and he tells the crew to row as fast as you can southward. Washington shows up. Um, Arnold's not there while well, he's gone over to West Point. Washington says, okay, we'll go over to West Point now then we'll do the inspection now. He takes his whole entourage over to West Point. Uh, when they get there, Nobody's seen Arnold for two days. He's not there. Washington starts looking over the fortifications. They're falling down. There's not enough men there to defend the forts. And um, Arnold, uh, General George Washington later described his his own thinking. He said, "My mind misgave me, but I had not the least idea." of the real cause. And I think we all know that feeling. It's like there's something very wrong going on here, but I can't put my finger on what it is. He went back over to Arnold's headquarters. He decided to take a nap. And he went up to, um, before he lay down in bed, the second courier arrived, handed him the documents and the letter. Um, he looked it over, immediately knew what was going on. And he called in Henry Knox, who's his most trusted subordinate. He said, Arnold has betrayed us. Who can we trust now? And there was not a rhetorical question because at that point, Washington didn't know who was involved or how far this plot went. He sent Alexander Hamilton riding by horseback down the east side of Hudson River to try to catch up with Arnold, apprehend him. He sent a message over to the army to send as many men, get them marching up towards West Point as you, fast as you can. And then the real drama began. Uh, this is Peggy Shippen and now Peggy Arnold. This is actually a, a drawing made by Major Andre back when Peggy Shippen was flirting with British officers when they uh, were in control of Philadelphia. And she started ripping her clothes off and screaming. She had to see Washington. They were going to kill her child. It was, And all the officers gathered around to comfort her because they thought that uh, she was so shocked by her husband's treason. And they didn't imagine that a woman could be so devious that uh, she would be in on the plot all along and was putting on an act to help her husband escape and he did escape and he got down to the british ship on the hudson river he joined the british army he was made a brigadier general he led british troops against americans for about a year burned the city of uh, new london which was right near his hometown went over to england and never set foot in america again the um, Major Andre, this is a portrait. He was a pretty good artist. He, this is a self-portrait he drew while he was waiting his trial, which came very quickly. Uh, and he was found uh, to be a spy and was hanged. The men who, um, the three militiamen who uh, captured Andre were given these medals there were the first military decorations in American history because they had stayed true to the cause and had the word fidelity sort of uh, 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 as a slap in the face to Arnold. Not too long after the uh, treason was revealed, one of Arnold's aides said, wouldn't it have been better if the bullet that went through his leg at Saratoga had gone through his heart. And that's a, uh, an idea that's been uh, repeated by historians down the years is um, if Benedict Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, he would be remembered as one of our greatest military heroes. And I think from the achievements that I've talked about here tonight, uh, you can see the logic of that idea but I don't think it's true. I think that if Benedict, Benedict Arnold had been killed at Saratoga, he would be forgotten. 
just like um, Nathaniel Green, Henry Knox, Israel Putnam, Richard Montgomery, um, all these heroes of the revolution that have largely been forgotten by the, by the general public. Um, I live in the Hudson Valley uh, and we have Greene County, Putnam County, Sullivan County, Montgomery County. But you ask people who, who are these places named for and they're, they're not really very clear about it. So I'm hoping that uh, as we approach the 250th anniversary that uh, some new attention can be given uh, to these people who just did the fighting. Because we're going to remember Benedict Arnold. But what about all the others, and particularly the men who fought in the ranks for a very long and very difficult war? And I think today, more than ever, it's important to, to uh, refresh our memories of the, of the revolution and of the values that they were fighting for. And if you read the letters and uh, diaries of that time, you often come across the idea that they expressed that they felt that they were uh, sacrificing for the freedom of generations unborn. They, they use that phrase. And we are those generations, and they were fighting for us. Thank you. We have any questions? If you do, I would kindly ask you to wait for the microphone so people on Zoom can hear us. So, after he went back to Britain, did the British have any trust in him, or did they were they afraid he would do the same thing to them that he did to the Americans? Uh, I'm, you're saying how did he get back to England? No, when he went back to Britain. Yeah. Did the British have any trust in him, or were they afraid that he would do the same thing to them? That he did to the Americans. There was, there was, uh, yeah, that's a good question. There was actually a, a lot of um, animosity, particularly in the British Army, because they had two reasons to, to hate Arnold. One was nobody likes a traitor, even if he's coming over to your side. You know, it's it's you realize he's a he's someone who betrayed his companions, and the other was that he had killed a lot of British soldiers. He was responsible for the death of a lot of British soldiers. So uh, Arnold wanted to be an active service after, you know, with the British uh, after he settled over there, uh, but he was never able to get a permanent uh, uh, position. And he even tried the, I think the East India Company had their own military um, out in India and they, even they wouldn't hire him. They said, you know, he was, he was, he was kind of radioactive in a lot of ways. He and Peggy, uh, Peggy uh, went over there with him and they came back to Canada for six years uh, and lived up there in an area that was a lot of loyalists had moved to. And even there, he ran into trouble. He was he could he had a hard time getting along with people He was a very prickly character. So uh, generally, they said he was even hissed at it when he went to the theater in, in London. Uh, the people didn't have any respect for him whatsoever. Uh, yes. Two, two questions. Um, the first one, is it true that he asked Peggy to bury him in his continental uniform instead of his British uniform? First question. Second question is, could you go a little bit deeper into Saratoga? You know, was Gates really the, um, the hero of Saratoga? Or would you argue that it really was Benedict Arnold and that he didn't get the credit that he deserves for Saratoga? Um. Yeah, as the first question was about, uh, I have definitely heard that story, and uh, I think it's been largely debunked. I don't think that there was anything to it. Uh, he wasn't sentimental, I think, in that in that way. Uh, it sounds good, you know. He said this last minute uh, regrets, but the 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 interesting thing to me was he never thought he committed treason. He thought he'd done the the right thing at every point when it was right to rebel, he rebelled. But when conditions changed, as he saw it, uh, the British had offered to, you know, 
the 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 uh, Carlisle Commission to come over and made peace offerings. Um, he thought, okay, now it's time to to uh, go along with the British in order to stop this terrible war, and I'm doing the right thing. And I think he always thought that. Um, and the second question was about Saratoga. Uh, my view is that I think uh, I think Gates was very a very smart general, and strategically uh, retreated just to the right point and let uh, Burgoyne wear himself out. Uh, a lot of the problem the British had was a lack of uh, forage, that their the horses were dropping dead. And when your horses drop dead, your army is, uh, and, and particularly all the artillery, is, is stranded. And that, as, as the time went on, that, that was more and more of a factor. In fact, the second battle was largely, uh, not largely, I'll say, but it was um, partly to try to find forage grain and, and feed for the horses. Uh, and I think that was, that was uh, the, the epitome of Gates. And I, th I think he did a very good job there, but somebody had to fight the battles and Gates was not really a battlefield uh, type of commander. And, um, and, and Arnold certainly was and inspired people and had that quick mind that could uh, take advantage of uh, the, the opportunities. And I think uh, was the, was the um, probably in some ways more important, but I, I would give a lot of credit to Gates. Of course, Gates's um, reputation also went down after, uh, particularly after the Battle of Camden and after his uh, always thinking he was uh, a little bit better than George Washington. So, uh, but I, and I think that reflected on, even though he was the hero of Saratoga, it sort of it was diminished because of that later. Yeah. The, uh, your last slide showed the medal that, uh, can, can you tell us what the medal on the right says? Yeah, let me go back there. Um, it's a fidelity on one side. This, this is one's the front, one's the back. They're not. They're not different battles. This is uh, Amor Vincent. Vincent Amor Patriot, uh, love of country conquers. And that that was, uh, Isaac Van Wart was one of the men that uh, his name is on there. <laughs> Chapters of Andre, yeah. Uh, just a little story about that. Um, there were there were medals given to all three of those militiamen, and as I mentioned, they were the first military decorations in history. Two of them were on display at the um, New York Historical Society for many years. Uh, in the seventies, they were stolen, and they've never been seen again. the The third one which I actually saw a couple of weeks ago, is now in the New York State Museum. It had passed down through the family, one of the, one of the militiamen, they donated it to the museum. What happened to the other ones is a, a mystery. Second question is, yeah. what do you mean by the title of your book? Uh, I, I chose that title for two reasons. One was, I, I have a sort of historical what if um, at the end of the book where, Benedict Arnold was uh, always trying to get a nautical uh, assignment. He wanted, he was, had been a sea captain before the war. He wanted to be out on the sea. And he felt after his injury, uh, his leg was never really healed properly. It would be a, a, a better place for him to be a captain of a boat than to be out in the field on a horse. And he tried several times to get that assignment, never did. Uh, but I just imagine what if he had gotten that, it might have neutralized the, his, his um, um, tendency is brooding over whatever it was he was brooding over at, that turned him traitor. And so he would have uh, uh, maybe not become traitor. And, uh, and I also thought of it as being uh, encouraging people to reserve moral judgment because everybody leaks, you know, oh, he, he was a, a bad, evil person because he was a traitor, yes, but he was also so much more than that. 
so leave it to the higher power to to judge him. That that was sort of the idea as well. Um, I read years ago that his family was well off, and certainly the house was very impressive. Um, and that he would have gone to Yale, except the family had lost their money by the time he was ready to go to college. Um, so he never went to college, right? right. Um, how old was he when the war broke out, 1775? Uh, he was, he was um, 36, I think. So 35. from- He was born in, or 40, Oh, let's see. I think he was born in nineteen and seventeen thirty one or forty one. I think it was seventeen forty one. So he would have been thirty five. Okay. So essentially, what did he do between the ages of eighteen and thirty five? Well, once his family fortune went down, his father became an alcoholic and and lost most of the family money. Uh, he became an apprentice with a, a, a company that was uh, associated with some relatives of his mother. He was called an apothecary, which is not a very, uh, doesn't give a very clear picture. Of what he, They were a, a major international trading company that he worked for them. And then he got in the same business. And that's what he did. He traded horses, lumber, uh, mostly down to the West Indies. And he, he became very wealthy uh, doing that and was uh, very successful at it. So. Thanks. Thanks very much for this. Uh, you mentioned some of the pressures that uh, Arnold was under as a, a general that might have contributed to his treason, none of which seemed like they were unique to him. But could you talk a little bit about some of the uh, how how other officers at, at his level or, or above, you know, dealt with, uh, you know, the inconstancy of Congress or, you know, the, you know, the, the, the you know, the promotion rules that weren't quite rules or or the lack of pay and, and the pressures that they might have felt that might have taken them in that direction, but didn't. Yeah, I, I think that's a, you make a very important point there because uh, I, I don't at all uh, raise that issue as, uh, as a, in any way exonerating Arnold because you're correct. Every, all the officers had that problem. All the officers felt slighted. I, I'll say all, but most of them at one point or another felt slighted. Uh, John Stark was one who very had a very similar situation, where uh, junior officers that he he thought were should not have been promoted were promoted over his head, and he just flat out walked away. He never he left the Continental Army. He later came back after Saratoga and his participation in Saratoga, but he he was just a during the Battle of Bennington he was just a militia general uh, for for New Hampshire, uh, so that was. The idea of, re, of resigning your commission was an honorable out for an officer who felt he didn't want to, uh, maybe his honor had been slighted. And I think there were other officers that did resign for that reason. Uh, but um, if you look at the, at the personality of Arnold versus George Washington, you know, Washington had a mind that could deal with that and, and, and Arnold just was he was too thin-skinned and um, um, I think responded uh, in the wrong way so we do have some questions on zoom um, okay well, there are a lot uh, and I know everybody wants to get home before midnight so I will try to go through um, some of these the best I can here um, we'll start with the uh, I hope would be an easy one. Uh, with all the books written on Arnold, what induced you to write about Arnold? Was it because of Val Gore, uh, the previous book, or? Yeah, I, I had done a lot of work on um, and, and learned quite a bit about Arnold from that book and from my previous book. Uh, and I, I just thought it was a, a remarkable story, one of the most interesting men in the in, of the era. And as I mentioned at the beginning, the the idea of using Arnold, who everybody knows, as a good portal into the um, into the early uh, uh, years of the revolution, he was just seen to be everywhere in all the major events. So it, it gives a, a, a kind of continuity to the story of the revolution itself. 
Great, thank you. Um, one one viewer would like to know: after the war, was did Arnold feel that he was ever in any physical danger, or was he in danger? Was there a secret plot to go get Arnold over uh, in Great Britain? Was he banned from entering U.S. territory? Can you discuss that a little bit? He uh, made contact with the British uh, more than a year before he actually the plot reached its fruition. And all during that time, he was risking his life. And any word had slipped out of British headquarters that they somehow found out that it was Benedict Arnold, it was their spy, um, he, he would have been captured and hung. As soon as it happened, they tried to trade Arnold for Andre. And uh, Henry Clinton, who was a very a big fan of Andre, um, was torn, but he he decided he couldn't do that because uh, um, uh, Benedict Arnold was uh, you know coming over. To, he was a deserter who would come over to their side, and if you start returning deserters and letting them be hanged by the enemy, then you're not going to get any more deserters. So uh, George Washington then got up a plot to uh, capture while Arnold was still in um, New York. And he sent a spy in there and, and did make progress towards the plot to uh, uh, grab Arnold and, and uh, get him over to New Jersey. Uh, and the, uh, just about the time that that plot was coming uh, to fruition, uh, Arnold, Arnold's regiment that he'd gotten up was sent down to Virginia and it was the, the moment was lost and that, uh, after that, there was the, I don't think any effort, Americans made any effort because basically war was over by that time. So how about, how about after the war? Did he feel that he was in danger or did? Well, he would have been in danger if he came back here. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. He, that he never came back for that reason. Peggy did come back uh, to visit her family uh, and received a, quite a cool reception from her friends. It was just kind of awkward. So she never came back after that. Sure. And to dovetail, um, Going along those same lines, after the war, did he express any remorse or, you know, regret for what he did? Uh, no, not none. What none whatsoever. You know, he he was, uh, he was not a happy man. But he, he like I was saying before, he he did not consider himself to be treason, a, a, a traitor or treasonous. Uh, he was trying to end the war, and he thought that was the best way to help his his uh, uh, fellow soldiers in the American army was to end the war as quick as possible. So th that was, I think, his the way he saw it for the rest of his life. Great, thank you. Um, are there any living descendants? There are a few questions about this of Arnold today. Uh, you know, that, that's a good question, living descendants. There probably are in England. Um, a number of his uh, descendants, all of his sons, he had, uh, I think, four or five sons that lived to adulthood were all in the British Army. His his oldest son was Benedict Arnold. The next Benedict Arnold uh, was killed in um, the in Jamaica during the Napoleonic Wars. Other descendants uh, down the years. Uh, were British Army officers, and some of them, even I think in World War One, was uh, were pretty high up. There were either admirals or generals, and uh, so there's probably is in England, uh, but I'm not I'm not really familiar. I'll have to look into that because I, I I've never heard of any particular person claiming to be that uh, a descendant of Benedict Arnold. Sure, um, and one viewer would like. Uh... To know, or if you could go, would like to know if you could go deeper into the theory or thought that uh, Arnold thought that maybe he could stop the war by siding with the British. Is is there any validity to that? Or yeah, that was definitely was his thinking, and uh, it it was conceivable. You know, if they if the handover of West Point uh, had um, been successful. The American cause was at a low ebb at that, you know, in 1780 was a very bad year. Uh, and Camden, the Battle of Camden, the loss of Charleston, things, the uh, Congress was running out of money. 
Uh, and if the British had taken um, West Point, it's possible that it could have, you know, it could have pushed the Americans at least to say, well, we'll negotiate a, a settlement and uh, and not try to carry it through to the end. And um, so it was a, in, in some ways a reasonable thing to think. And um, one viewer is asking a, a, a question about Benjamin Talmadge. Um, he, he says, Benjamin Talmadge opposed compensation of the three militiamen who captured Andre. One historian says that this was due to his disdain of lower class soldiers. Is there any validity to that? Well, uh, Talmadge was involved in that. Uh, in fact, he um, he was uh, not a. I think he he was a major maybe at that point, and he he couldn't order this Colonel Jameson, Colonel John Jameson, who was the commander down at the very south end of the American lines. He couldn't order them him to do anything, but he advised him, you know, don't don't, don't send a, a letter to Arnold and was involved in what to do with the, the uh, with Andre. And um, as far as that, whether he didn't had disdain for them, I, I'm not, I, I really don't know about that. They were, they were, they, they were actually quite famous for a while when they, after they got the silver medal and they uh, were a well-known characters uh, and they all got pensions as well. Great. And I think, We'll wrap up with one more question, and uh, this one is directly, obviously, to you. But during your research, uh, what was there anything that was shocking or most surprising to you about Arnold that you discovered? Um. I think that one thing that I, I always kept coming back to was that his in his childhood, he had influences from both parents. His father became an alcoholic, uh, and Arnold not only had the very uh, searing duty of going out and, and picking him up from the street and bringing him home when he was drunk, but saw that the townspeople had scorn for him. They laughed at him. He, they, they rejected him from the church. And that really uh, was a, seemed to resonate for the rest of his life, that sensitivity to his slights and that uh, a feeling of maybe insecurity because of what he'd seen in his father. And on the other hand, his mother, who was a very devout Calvinist, uh, kept saying and writing to him and saying, always remember you're going to die. Keep that in your mind at all times. And she had seen like three or four of her children did die. And uh, Arnold was not a particularly religious as far as anybody knows, but uh, he, I think, absorbed that Calvinist fatalism. And maybe it was part of his, uh, his intuition as a, a military officer that he was able to um, uh, risk his life without much qualm about it, and uh, made him uh, a pretty good, a pretty good fighter. Great, thank you. And in case anybody is wondering, we do have a member of the Society of the Cincinnati in the chat here saying, "No, his descendants are not eligible for membership." So, um, <laughs> if anybody wants to know that answer. Um, uh, Jack, I want to thank you very much for coming out, and I would encourage you to go purchase uh, Jack's book, uh, where all major books are sold. And if you do want to learn more about Arnold's experience at Saratoga, we are having our next battlefield tour at Saratoga uh, on April 12th and 13th. It's a two-day experience. You can learn more about that on our website. Registration is now open. Um, but Jack, thank you again for coming out okay, and speaking thanks. for us tonight. Thank you all for attending, and both in person and in Zoom, and for your con yeah your continued support of our mission. So happy holidays, get home safe, and we'll see you next time.